If you will, look with me in your Bibles in Revelation chapter 18. I want to speak with you on the church's rejoicing. I know we've been looking at some pretty grim descriptions of false religion under the guise here of Babylon falling. And these are not easy passages of scripture to have to read and preach, but nonetheless necessary. And yet, in the midst of all this, uh, we see, as in Revelation 18 and verse 20, a word of encouragement to the Lord's people. We certainly don't want to encourage anybody in false religion, false hope. I know if it's acquaintances and people that we know that are in it, we try to sometimes figure out a way to talk to them in a loving way, but never in a compromising way. Because the reality is if the Lord leaves them there, then they'll know nothing but eternal separation from God. I wonder if you think about that. I do. It's easy in this life you know, to talk to people and talk about the things that are going on in the world. and But we live in a lost world. And reality is that every person that you read about in the newspaper, unless the Lord has redeemed them, they are facing the very reality of the things that we're studying. And the day's coming when all of this will be made manifest for what it is therefore a very sobering subject and yet you see here in verse 20 it says rejoice not if you're in false religion you can't rejoice but rejoice if the Lord has been pleased to teach you something of himself and as we sang when I survey the wondrous cross giving you eyes to see all of God's glory in that one who came, lived, died, and rose again, ascended on high. That name that is above every name, that the name of Christ every knee should bow. Rejoice over her. Rejoice over the fall of false religion. Thou heaven. In other words, those that are in heaven, those that are in the very presence of God and enjoying his presence forever and ye holy apostles and prophets who are these but men that had been slain for this very testimony of Christ for God hath avenged you on her it's an interesting way of putting it that we'll look at in a little bit and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down. Now again, we know that Babylon had already been destroyed. So this is not referring here to a physical city called Babylon, but spiritual Babylon. In other words, false religion. And shall be found no more at all. That's an important an important uh, statement because right now false religion is rampant and growing. I don't believe it's like some of the old writers who believe that if we just would get out there and sow the seed of the gospel, God would turn things around. You hear about some of these old writers always talking about a revival. We've been through periods of what men have called revivals. I've, as I've studied some of the follow-up, I cannot say that it's been of God. You've heard probably about the Great Awakening in the, here in the United States and during the days of Jonathan Edwards. And men have promoted that as being a great work of God and his spirit in the propagation of the gospel. As I look back on it, it was nothing more than the propagation of religion. You read some of the writings of Jonathan Edwards, and 
see some of the legalism that he promoted, even under the name of Christ and the gospel. And you look at some of the congregations that have been formed in the United States as a result. You can even go up to Boston, and I've attended, or at least uh, been by that place where he supposedly preached and, and had the so-called revival in his day. But I don't believe, you have to understand his mindset. You read about what he believed. He believed that the United States was the promised land, this territory that we call the United States. All these men that came over had the notion that if we would just keep promoting the kingdom of God, things would get better and better. Sinners would be more and more subject to Christ, and then Christ will come again once the groundwork is laid. That was his viewpoint. Well, it's a false viewpoint. Even contrary to what Christ said, when the Son of Man comes again, shall he find faith on the earth. I truly believe it'll be like in the days of Noah, where there'll be few. And that's part of the call to which we are called, if we're to stand for the truth. If your whole mindset is growing numbers, then you're sitting under the wrong message. And this is about glorifying Christ and as many as he is pleased to call, you see. But there is coming a day when false religion shall be no more at all. And that is the rejoicing. It says here, the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. So you can just underscore how many times this, this is definitive. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And there again, the word sorceries is a sense of deception, devilish deception of false religion. We talked about that in our Bible class, how truth is mingled with error. And it's subtle, and yet men will follow the error because that's their nature to do so, unless God teaches them otherwise. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. I want to keep reading verse 19 because it's connected. We start here in verse 20 of 18 with rejoice. But in verse 19, the same theme continues. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, false religion, Babylon being one, the great whore being another, but it's the same description of false religion which did corrupt the earth and with her fornication in other words spiritual adultery drawing men away from the one true God and Savior and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand and again they said alleluia and her smoke rose up forever and ever and the four and twenty elders, again remember, the symbol of the church, 24 elders, 12 of the Old Testament, 12 of the New, 24. And the four beasts, representing the angels, all right, the cherubim, fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, in other words, revere him, 
worship him in truth, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters. Again, I can only think of the thundering noise of, of the Niagara Falls. <laughs> That's the only thing I've ever stood next to that sounds like the voice of many waters. You just, you, you, unless you've experienced it, you don't know, but that's the description that's used here. And as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. People can contest all they want to about God being sovereign, but in the end, it's gonna be shown that he is. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. So again, the same theme here. The church is rejoicing for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. You know, the scriptures say, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. That's what our Lord spoke of there on the Sermon on the Mount. And I have to say that for God's children, traversing the pathway of this world, there is a lot of sorrow in there. If you in any way are finding your delight in this world, something's wrong. Because as I look back on my lifetime, it's not that I've suffered physically or materially, I've been blessed above measure. But when I think about the spiritual burdens and sorrows of living in this life. I don't know why anybody would want to live one day longer here. Do you? Unless your heart is set on this world. Abraham sought a country that was not of this world. And I fear that even some of you sitting here are still trying to find your happiness in circumstances in this world hoping things will just get a little bit better. When in reality, perhaps the Lord is bringing affliction, bringing trouble, turning your world upside down for one reason, that you not set your heart on this world and that you look to Christ alone. If it turns out being that, that's a blessing. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. <laughs> We're like kids, we hang on, don't we? Hang on to the candy. We think that's for our good, and the Lord has to just break our knuckles to get it out. That's a blessing. I'm thankful. I, not that I rejoice in any kind of sorrow that you're facing or unsettledness in your life, no more than I would necessarily want it for myself or my family, but just know that these are graces <laughs> that the Lord brings to pass mercifully to keep us from driving our tent stakes too deep. The purpose of a tent is what? Pick it up and fold it up and move it on. And that's what we are, pilgrims passing through. And how unlike the care of the unconverted world that just seems to constantly try to rebuild, rebuild, rebuild. You know, uh, we bear some burdens. You can understand it as parents. You bear burdens for your children as parents, and I do, that the kids don't even perceive, do they? They wonder why mom and dad are all so uptight. You know what? Come on, dad. Come on, mom. And I mean, you're in your mind, you're just playing all kinds of scenarios. <laughs> you see the danger, and it's a burden. You know, even if it's one minute after midnight. <laughs> All, all these things go through your mind because you understand what this world is about. Kids don't. They're just going full bore like, like nothing was. You know, that, that's the same way spiritually that we live in this world. We're, we're of this world. We, we're in it, but we're not of it. When you talk to people about your concerns, even for their soul, they, they look at you like, why are you so concerned? That's because we see the end. We see the end, and we know what the Lord has delivered us from. And so as we read these things, 
we are concerned. I don't want anybody to think that this rejoicing here is in the sense of ha, ha, ha. Now you've got what's coming to you. But there is a rejoicing here that I believe is God-given. And we're going to see what that is. But particularly, as I said, in the face of so much false religion, in all of its many facets, we carry around this constant burden wherever we see friends and acquaintances drunken with its philosophies and mindset. You know, I, as much as I thank the Lord for the opportunity to go overseas and preach the gospel in Malawi and, and India, you know, people almost look at that like you're on a tour or as if it's, you know, it must be exciting. But when your mindset is going not to see the world, but to preach to lost souls, and wherever you go, you see false religion, it's hard to call it a vacation. It's not. You know, I've had people say, well, I wish I could do that. I'd, I'd love to be able to go to Malawi. And they start talking about Madonna. You know, uh, or uh, I'd like to go to India, and uh, I, I just love to study cultures. Well, that wasn't my purpose in going. It has to do with taking the gospel to a lost world. And I'll tell you, that, that's a burden. You stay up at night riding that airplane all those hours thinking about souls to whom you'll preach. Do you have that burden, or am I just an isolated man here? How do you pray for these in India? How do you pray for these in Malawi? This, is, this isn't about a mission program. Now let's throw that in the wastebasket. I've had people say that to me. How is it your little small church has such a vast mission program? It's not a mission program. It was something that the Lord put in my lap. And I fought it for two years. And got to where I had to go. I had to go. I don't enjoy giving up the comfort of my family. I could just as easy sit in the easy chair. But when the Lord puts it in front of you, you go. And I'll tell you this, your role in this is as vital as mine. Either you're with this message or you're not. Either you, it's one thing to carry this message over to Malawi and India, but what about right here in this city? We're in a lost world, and there's something wrong with our perspective and the way we live our lives and plan our week if this is not uppermost. And I'm saying anything about our livelihoods and jobs and pursuits and what we're doing. If this, the glory of Christ, is not uppermost in our mind, then there's one thing we need to do, and that's repent. Repent. Have we gotten to the point where we think we're beyond repentance? That's something we need daily. Daily. I pray the Lord give us this burden, not, not, not in the sense of, of religion, seeing how many souls we're going to get saved. That's not it. But I'm talking about just the perspective, the spiritual perspective to see the end of these things, to see Christ exalted and seated upon his throne, and that if he has by his grace called this poor sinful soul to himself and paid that sin debt that I might be among this number one day crying salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. That is the greatest blessing that I as a sinner could ever anticipate. You know, that helps me through the afflictions. <laughs> that helps me through the hard times. That helps me through the contrary winds, you see, of this life and this world. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, if you look over there, I believe Paul's 
vexation of spirit is summed up right here and, and describes what I'm endeavoring to tell you. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, it says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, he waited for Timothy and, and uh, Silas to join him. You know, he, he didn't go on a tour of Athens, thought, well, this is a famous city. I think while I'm in Athens, I'll just see as much of the city as I can. It says here, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. That's what I'm endeavoring to communicate. Do we have this burden or not? Or have we become so numbed to it all that we go on, you know, like a frog where you can slowly boil the frog to death just by slowly turning up the, the heat. I've never tried to do that, but I hear it's, it can be done. Where he keeps adjusting in his temperature, blood, until... Finally, he's bowled to death. And I wonder how many times we become numb to what's going on around us. May God grant us eyes and a spirit to understand, again, that we're dealing with a lost world and we're dealing with a true condemnationers. And that, as I said, someday it's going to matter. Someday it's going to matter. You know, we don't need to debate and argue with sinners over the truth. If they'll not hear, it's because the Spirit of God has not yet done His work in them. I understand that. Our assurance is that if the Lord has paid for them at Calvary, then in time He will draw them to Christ in repentance. I believe that wholeheartedly. And if not, all we can do is point them to the word and portions of scripture such as we have here that we've been considering and warn them of what lies ahead. If they'll not read the scriptures, then it's because there's no light. In them. But let's point them to the scriptures. Let's don't get into debates. Even Satan can use that to distract men. They, they like to talk about where Cain got his wife. And, and people will try to draw you into all of these different discussions of something they heard even their preacher talking about Sunday. And they want to know, you know, it, rather than go down that path with them, just it would be better to stop and say, if you want to talk about scriptures, let's talk about something even more important than that. That just puts a nix on it. What think ye of Christ? What think ye of his death? It'll save you a lot of heartache as well because you don't want to go down that path with them. You know, I've, I've had people call up and say they were discussing with somebody and they're trying to find a verse that proves this or that. And I just stop them and say, you know, I could give you some verses either way, but really, what is the importance of it? If they don't know Christ, if they haven't understood the very foundation that, that this whole Bible has to do with Christ, and not whether women wear veils or not, or whether we're to leave our shoes at the door when we come into a worship place, or tithe, all of these things that religion promotes and tries to use this book to defend, they don't know Christ. That's the issue, Christ. All right? But the day is coming when the church will rejoice over the downfall and destruction of false religion. That's the negative side of this, all right? But more so, rejoice over the full revelation of salvation accomplished at the cross. That's the positive side of this rejoicing. That work of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he himself, as we read here in chapter 19, will enjoy the full satisfaction, if you will, of what he accomplished, having everyone there for whom he died. What a blessing. Now, what is this rejoicing? I mentioned that earlier that we would look at it. When it says here in verse 20, rejoice. The word is the word we get, our word euphoria. 
from. I know it's used in different ways today, and it's someone, a euphoria, just an excitement. But in the scriptural sense, it means a, a delight that's based upon something that has been promised and now fulfilled. And that's our hope of glory. We await. <laughs> you know, it, in my mind, it can't be soon enough. I know I have a burden for lost souls, but I'll tell you this, it can't be soon enough. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Whether he come in my lifetime to take me from this world in death, or whether he come to completely wrap up this world as a tent and fold it away, it can't be soon enough. That's the idea of euphoria. It's like you've planned an event. It might be a marriage, it's something that you're looking forward to, and, and suddenly the day's here. <laughs> That's the sense of the word here. Rejoice. Rejoice. Actually, literally translated, it is be ye being merry. <laughs> it's in the present tense. In other words, here is a rejoicing that will never be taken away. It's continual. We have moments of rejoicing, don't we? You like to try to always think, well, I can always be rejoicing, but something's gonna come and pop that balloon, and all of a sudden, we're just right back down into the pit again, you know, and you climb out for a moment and back down in the pit. But here is a rejoicing, be ye being merry. And it's going to be exclusive to those that God has chosen and that Christ has redeemed and called to himself. The world won't be able to enter into it. Be ye being merry or rejoicing. So what's the reason for the rejoicing? Let me just give you three or four different thoughts that I have written down from this portion of Scripture. What is the reason for rejoicing? Well, first of all, because God has avenged. The word literally rendered there means to render your just sentence for you on them. <laughs> I know it's a little bit difficult. That's the way the translators put it here in verse 20. For God hath avenged you on her. But if you translate it literally, it is... God has rendered your just sentence for you on her. In other words, we don't have to defend ourselves before men. You know, people, when you talk about election, they want you to defend that position. I don't have to. I just know what the scriptures say. When you tell people that Christ didn't die for everybody, but he died for a particular people. They want you to defend that. They want you to prove it. You don't have to. You just know it's so based upon what this word teaches. And the thing is that when God in this day manifests himself for who he is, you're going to find out that it's exactly the way he said it was in this word. And you already knew it, but the difference is now they find out. They find out. It's like trying to argue with somebody that you can't reason with them. Well, you'll see. You'll see. That's the sense here, for God hath avenged you on her. We're talking about people that paid with their lives. You know, when, when they put a man to death, based upon what he's testified, as these apostles and prophets were called upon to do, I'm sure that the executioners, in their minds, when they put them to death, had to go home wondering what it was about that persuasion that could not be changed, that they preferred death to compromise. Well, the day's coming when they'll find out, unless the Lord is pleased to call them to himself. There are those. Saul was one. He persecuted unto death a number. And when the Lord met him on that road to Damascus, remember what he said, how long will you kick against the pricks? 
That's the sense of there was something in his conscience already working as to how Stephen died and how he observed that. Couldn't get out of his mind. The Lord was merciful in calling him to himself and not leave him to go down the pathway of judgment. But there's some who die in that opposition. The day will be manifest. God will manifest himself to be right in what he did in their lives. This is why we don't take the arm of the flesh to defend ourselves in these matters. But we commend our very souls and lives to God. Secondly, why we rejoice? Well, because at this time, the church will see the reality of what to this point is for us a promise, isn't it? It's a hope of glory. It's a hope. It's a true hope. It's a good hope. But it's not one that the world has seen, realized yet. But it's coming. It's coming. The world mocks. The world of unbelievers mocks. But nonetheless, we know it to be so. If you look over in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter wrote to this end. In verse 1, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. He could only be writing to those that have been regenerated by the Spirit here. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, made holy by the blood of Christ, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. See, it's not going to get better. Scoffers. Walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby this, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, men who do not fear God. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, we think in increments of time, but even if 2,000 years have passed, it's still only like two days to the Lord. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, now this is important, to usward. In other words, to his own to those he has chosen, to those whom Christ has redeemed, not willing that any, and he can't pull it out of the context, of us should perish. Any of those that he's purposed to save. Why hasn't he wrapped this whole thing up yet? There must still be some sheep out there that he's, he's purchased, he's chosen, and he'll bring to himself. That's the only explanation I have but that all, again, of us, the us word, you know, you got to keep it in the context, should come to repentance. All that he's chosen, all for whom Christ has died, he will bring to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein, works of men, any kind of religion that's been built upon the works of men, destroy. They shall be burned up. That's the context here of rejoicing. The realization when this thing happens, and it can't come too soon, but when it does, rejoicing in seeing the reality and the fulfillment of it. Seeing then, verse 11, that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, God-fearing, a conversation in connection with that holiness 
that God has given to his people through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's precious. That's the sense here. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. <laughs> That's what we look for. That's what the rejoicing is all about. All right? The third reason. There's four here, and I'll be done. The third reason for rejoicing, in the positive sense, now down in chapter 19, is because God has proven himself to be exactly what he said he is throughout history in his holy word. Sovereign, holy, just, and faithful to his truth, faithful to his righteousness, faithful to himself. You know, you go back up in verses 22 through 24, that uh, symbol of the millstone is very striking. It, it says there in verses 21 to 23, a strong angel picks it up and casts it into the sea, never to be found anymore. So definitive will be the fall and destruction. See? Religion mocks today. When you talk to them about God's sovereignty and the exclusiveness of the gospel, religion mocks says, well, who are you? You're meeting in a little church building. Look at our building. Look at our parking lot. How big's your budget? Look at our budget. These are all things that they use to compare flesh with flesh. It's not going to make any difference someday. All those works are going to be destroyed. And God will prove himself to his people, his sovereignty, <laughs> and his justice, his truth, you see. When it says no more at all the sound of music, as you see there in verse 22, the religious world can't live without it. But it's not what's vital to the church. You know, in religion, many make their craft with music and promote themselves as performers, yet the day's coming when there'll be no more place for them. No more place. And then it says down there in verse 23, the light of a candle shall shine no more. I believe that's talking about the gospel that they considered as a candle. There won't even be the possibility of even hearing the gospel. It's done. It's over. Where they took it lightly in their day and preferred to follow the crowd than to hear the truth. The day's coming when it'll be no more. You can see God will prove himself sovereign, holy, and just. This word here in verse 1 of chapter 19, alleluia, everybody's using it. It actually means praise be to God. Praise be to God. The true God. Now there's people that can't give praise to God when you start talking to them about his sovereign choice over sinners. He loved Jacob. He hated Esau. People get upset. They, you know, and they're the ones that normally dancing around saying, Hallelujah. <laughs> well, which God are we praising here? But the context, as you'll see here, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Capital L O R D. That's talking about his sovereignty. And notice salvation in verse 1 and judgment in verse 2 belong unto him. He's to be glorified whether he's saving sinners or whether he's condemning them. There's a lot of people, your religious friends and mine, that, that can't, they, they can't fathom a God, a loving God, sending people to hell. Well, a loving God doesn't send people to hell. A loving God saves sinners, but a righteous God does. If he loved sinners, he saved them. There's not one sinner that God has loved that's going to be in hell. But there are many sinners who will be in hell that God will exercise his righteous judgments upon and be just in doing so. And this judgment here is manifest in the smoke of Babylon. You can see it there, the smoke of Babylon, verse 3 that rises up forever and ever. How eternal is God's judgment forever and ever? 
all these notions of praying for the dead, lighting candles for the dead, and somehow thinking that all of these works and indulgences of men are going to somehow shorten a person's suffering. That's nothing but part of Babylon, false religion. We don't pray for the dead. We pray for those that are still alive, that if God be pleased to direct their hearts to Christ, that he would do so. But if not, we give them the glory. We give them the glory. We hold our peace. You can see all of his glorious attributes are manifest here in the truth in verse 1. This other reason why the church rejoices because of the reality of being fully and completely united to the Lamb. See that in verse 7? Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. That's what heaven's all about, isn't it? Christ, the Lamb. Is that who you think on? Is that where your hope is? I pray so. All right.